than sounds. And so now I think on this Catalactica, you hear more of that, that you hear the Atlanta, you hear the Houston, you hear the Memphis, and it's all coming together into something unique. So now the paradigm has been expanded in advance rather than simply being refined, even though it's being refined in the course of this. Right. Like this, I really think a lot of people who heard Live from Underground were like, nah, I'm not really fucking with this cat. This is the one that'll make you turn this around. This one. And I like that he opened himself up production-wise and, yeah. and, and decided to work with other people and and learn from what they could bring to the table. Well, it's funny. I talked. I was talking to Wally about that a long time ago because I learned a lot, like in watching what was going on with his career at a time where what was going on with my career. Right? Was, there were some parallels that were going on. It's like 2010 when his shit started jumping, my shit started jumping. Right? And you know the things started going. And one thing I was learning at that time was the ability to collaborate and to let other people contribute to what I was doing. Like you have to have. You have your own vision, and everybody has a tendency to get territorial about Mm -hmm. their own vision. At some point, you look up and realize that your vision is always going to have some limitations. So you're going to want to hand things to people who know your vision and then can add something to it. So like when I used to produce YouTube videos, I would write my stuff out, I would do my shots, and I would leave, and I wouldn't see them until they came up because I wanted somebody else's voice in there because I can only think of what I can think of. So if somebody else can think of something different, now we can make this better. And it's more important to have a good product than it is to have your quote unquote vision. And so I wondered, I hadn't talked to these guys in a while about this stuff, but I'd wonder when that point was going to come where there was just an evolution and a realization as you get older, like there's nothing wrong with letting somebody Not help me make my shit better. Not at all. And I think that that's what happened. Not here. at all. I, I tweeted today, man, that, you know, we live in this sick as a cynical age where we like to shit on music, but there's a lot of good music out there. There is. Right now. And and 2014 has been a very strong year musically, man. Yeah, you know. It's got music for everybody. Well, what I think is going to happen is once it just gets to a point where nobody can make money selling records, then the music is going to get better. Mm-hmm. Because if you're trying to make the money selling records, then you're going to do what the label tells you no matter what. And the labels, the labels got a different agenda, right? If it gets to the point where you're going to make your money off your touring and your sales and everything else, then all you worry about is your yes, people. Yeah. Like, And this is something I know as somebody who works for a major corporation. The stuff that I handle myself is for my people, for right? My for the people. It's for, who, it's for you. Right. You know, and for the people who've been listening to podcasts, yeah. the people who bought t shirts. Those are my people. Those are the people that I brought with me. And then this is when this thing ends. Those are the people that are going to go with me. And there are going to be some other people that come up peripherally on the label stuff, but you can't get fully invested in chasing money you don't have. I think it was Chuck D. He said this on Twitter many years ago. I thought it was really interesting. He said, if you got a Facebook fan page and your fan page has 10 fans, then your fan page needs to be for those 10 fans. Yep. Chasing money that you don't have is corporate thinking. Chasing the right? audience you, can't, you don't have. You is, can't do that. You, you got to work with the audience that you got. Right. So I do think that if the money dries, if the big money dries up, the money's always going to wind up being there and touring, right? If that big label money dries up, then it stands to reason that the market will go toward people focusing on what it is that they do. Like when Nipsey Hussle did that crazy $1,000 mixtape thing. It was $100. $100. I was on board. And the reason I was on board, I had a problem with it later. Did it you didn't, buy it? Oh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not that guy. Okay. I'm not the Nipsey Hussle You weren't fan. that on board. Right. right. Be, no, I was on board in principle. Okay. Because I'm not in the audience that would buy the $100 mixtape, right. right? Like, I was bothered when he later said that they were throwaways because I felt like he was disrespecting his audience. Right. But what he was saying was, look, these are the people that are with me. There's a set of people that will pay $100 for this because they're going to be down, and I'll give them extra stuff or whatever it is. But this is for, you know, this is dedicated for the ones that have been down since day one, right? Clang. Right. You know? <laughs> you know, but, that, but there's something for that. Like, once you figure out, like, look, this is the audience that I got. Cali boys did that all the time. Like in the '90s, we forget that all those dudes in Cali were going platinum without trunk. getting spins anywhere out the else. Trunk, out mm. the trunk, you know. Yeah. M- MC, nah, hustle. MC Ren went platinum with an EP. Uh. People forget that, you know. <laughs> so you could make that money. For, I'm from Houston. Right. Cats are not worried about like Chameleonaire and Paul Wall. I knew those dudes in high school. Right. They made that music for Houston, and when the Houston time came up nationwide. They never, ever turned away from where their actual base was. Right. So if you're not worried about chasing that major label stuff, then then the music goes back local. And this music is always better when it's local. Yeah. That's how New York lost its foot and was we, stop we, trying to we, be we're local. We're not local. We're not lo- has no, there's no sound but, left but in the, New York. But, but to, to New Yorkers' credit, and I've, and I've spoken about this before, the culture of New York has changed so drastically that we're still trying to figure out what the fuck is going right. on. Right, and that's an interesting part about how, like, how does how did these change in demographics of the city and moving people out of where they've been forever? New York how does has, that ultimately I, I'm still trying to figure out what it means to be a New York in 2014, mm. man. What do you what do you think about Rich Gang, man? 
Yeah. It's crazy, right? Yeah. Like, I don't even have that, like, much of an opinion because I haven't gotten, like, real deep into right. it. They're, they're on the I'm more aware of them than right. I could really, like, speak on them, right, you know? Right. I had to listen because I, I had to figure out what the fuck was going on. And who was it? Who was it that was on the show? I forgot who it was. It might have been Crit. It might have been somebody. And they were like, listen, like, if, you, if you're judging them from the level of rappers, they're going to fail. But if you're judging them from taking sounds and making it music, yeah. Uh, and I found that the production is crazy. I just it's, it's just crazy, man. I, I, I'm still I'm still curious as to what the fuck is going on. Yeah, you know, and that's the point. We're at that age now where we don't know exactly. The music ain't for us no more. It ain't for us Nobody no more. like that's. I guess that's part of why I like right run the jewels. Like, no, oh right. my god, somebody cares about what I think. Yeah. <laughs> Although, I'll tell you, man, I'm a big Migos fan. You know what? I appreciate it for what they are. Like, yeah. I went to the Outcast shows and I saw, uh, like, different, at different points, some of the young Southern dudes was like the, uh, the, I don't know how to say their name, the, uh, the No Flex Zone dudes. Um, sh- sh- yeah, 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 I ain't got like, Ray Sh- Ray Sh- Sh- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drummers ear backwards. You're right, ear drummers. <laughs> yeah. Dude, they got on stage with B.O.B. at the Sunday night show, and I'm 34 years old, yeah. man. You know, that music ain't for me. Dog, they were so hype. It was so dope. They like, I was just up, looking at it. They turned up, turned up so strong. And I'm like, that. this is not for me, but, but I can appreciate yes. what it is right, that right, you right. little fellas are doing. Yeah, yeah, Good yeah, for yeah. you. And they're yeah. little fellas, they're, too. They're, yeah, little. And, and that's the dope thing about it. But I, I will say this, talking about artists, talking about rappers, what's your thoughts on, like, the NBA, you know, starting to hire rappers? Like, Drake uh, is is um, working with the Raptors. Wale is working with the Wizards. I mean, is this something that you see that can trickle down to you know, different states? But it's interesting, though, because black rappers have become so useless to the industry, like on a pop, like in, in, in that in that mainstream world, we have been rendered obsolete. Like, you know, I came up, I graduated from high school in 1997. So I can remember when we were actually like getting on to MTV with real stuff, mm-hmm. right? Like it wasn't like a necessarily compromised stuff, you know, gin and juice, and all, you know, these things were really getting mainstream play, and that's so over now, right? right? So it's crazy to me that the NBA teams are looking at it like, nah, 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 nah. We've got a certain value after the NBA had run away from rap for the better that's part of the right. last 10 years. Right. Now a lot of them are like, hey, here it is. But what that also is, the rap game has changed yes. in a way where Drake can be a mainstream dude and you don't have to worry about offending people by having Drake out there. Like when people talk about like, Criticizing gangster rap in this day and age, man, you twenty years late, homie. That's not what's going on no, it's anymore. Not, it's not happening right now. That ain't that ain't what the game is. Right, right. It's nice, cuddly, approachable rappers by and large, which is funny because the NBA in the last ten years has become much more about nice, cuddly, approachable players. Right. What do you think about Jay Z's involvement right now in sports? You know, I'm still not sure exactly what his involvement is. Like, I know it's Rock Nation Sports and his name is on the sign, but I've not. I mean, I'm, they've made a lot of noise, but. Yeah, I'm not. Ter- and signed a lot of players. But I'm not terribly convinced that he's not Uncle Ben on the box. Like, I'm not. Calling, what, what, what do you mean by that? I mean that he's on the box, but I don't know if he. Own, like, if he's, is he the one selling the rice? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, kind of like the whole Brooklyn Nets thing. Exactly. Like, I'm not calling him out on this, right. right? Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that don't, he's. Don't go vile with this right, internet. Right now, let's be clear. I'm not saying that he's Uncle Ben. Right. But I'm just saying, like, is he the guy on the box? Or is he the guy that's running the company? And that's right. difficult for me to tell, like with the Nets. But to be fair to him, he parlayed his one half or one percent or whatever it is, and he got a lot out of it for himself. So, right. like, I respect Jay Z as a hustler in that sense that he could figure out how to make money. The only problem I have is I do feel like he's discussed in the context of power brokers in a way that I have not seen whether or not he's actually a power broker. Right. I think that he is at a position where he's visible enough that he can help make money for a lot of other people. But is he in charge of anything? Mm. Like, I, like, say what you want. You look at uh, Diddy, for example. Yes. Diddy's in charge Diddy's of in stuff. Charge. Like, he legitimately wields power. 50's in charge. 50's shit. in charge of right. stuff. I can't quite tell exactly what Jay-Z is in charge of. And if he's not in charge of anything, I don't begrudge him that fact. I just don't want people to tell me that he's in charge of something right, if right, he's right. not. Right, right, I get it. Because then, then we all get played, right? Because then it winds up being that your goal is thinking you're in charge, and you get up there, and you're like, wait a minute, man, I just work for y'all still? <laughs> you know, like, what's that about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, I'm a casual sports fan. Mm-hmm. Um, but even casually, man, I'm looking at this LeBron hype, man. Is, is, is this LeBron mania too crazy, man? I, I'm not a fan of this. And I think a lot of people think that because I live in Miami, I have a problem with it, and that's not it. Right. Like, I'm not from Miami. Right. I just got there. I am fascinated by a couple of things, though. One, he took over the game. 
Mm-hmm. He is so powerful right now. He basically runs an NBA franchise. He got all his buddies on the team and all of this other stuff. Like when he went back at first, I was like, dude, you can't go back to work for that man. And then I realized, oh, he's not going back to work for that man at all. That man's cutting him checks, but right. LeBron's in charge here. Yes. You know, and Dan Gilbert's going to happily take all the money that comes from it. But I think LeBron looked up and realized this man's going to be rich regardless. I can do what I want from here and I'm going to pull it off. Now, what we have found, the numbers show this, all the popularity that he lost from the decision he got right back just by going to Cleveland. Did you think that shit was going to even be possible? No, I did not. I, I Apparently, a lot of groundwork took place over a lot of years. I didn't think that they would ever leave Miami to go back to Cleveland. Now, maybe that was me applying my personal sensibilities. I can't. Because you wouldn't go. I, I'm not about that cold. <laughs> like, I'm not about that cold. But I also, I can understand how someone wouldn't want to live in Miami. Right. And I don't know how it's, you know, there have been competing narratives about how his family felt about living there. Some people say they wanted to stay. Some people say they wanted to leave. But all that popularity, people got it right back. They really eat up that going home thing, which I personally cannot relate to. Um, I grew up in Houston. I like Houston. I ain't going back. You sure not? Uh, my parents live, yeah. You sure you're not going back to Houston? Boy, it's been 17 years. Man. Dreams. Yeah, there's that. There's that. <laughs> Yo, they got the best food after like 3 p.m. That that, that fried shrimp. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, it's amazing to say that. But did you see the Nike commercial that I did. LeBron did? I what, did. What's your I, thoughts on that? I did not think that that commercial was his idea. Mm. And the reason I say that is it was very clear about doing this for Cleveland fans. We're going to do this for Cleveland. We're going to do this for this That was too dramatic, city. man. But if you look back at everything that he said, it's always about Akron. He's from Akron. AK. He's from Akron. And Akron and Cleveland are not the same place. Just because they're close to us doesn't mean that they're the same thing. And when he did his whole thing about coming back to Cleveland in Sports Illustrated, he specified how important Northeast Ohio was. He talked about how angry the Cleveland fans made him. He never said he forgave them necessarily. Then I look at that commercial and they mm. put that out there. And I'm like, we're really selling this. My larger problem, I don't understand why people think I'm supposed to root for Cleveland. Like, why am I supposed to feel bad for Cleveland? Right. I like me personally. Yeah. I don't understand. I, look, I root for Atlanta sports teams. Now, granted, the Braves won a world championship in 95. That's the only difference between Atlanta and Cleveland is a World Series that nobody remembers, right? Ain't nobody out here wrapping their arms around Atlanta talking about, we hope you guys do well, and it's so sad. All the, I got sadness. We all got sadness. <laughs> New, York, New, York yeah, got New York got sadness. 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 Shit. Like, Next tape. <laughs> right? Like, how do we decide that we were going to wrap our arms around Down this Cleveland. team, and especially after the way they acted when LeBron left, Savages. Why would I want to continue exactly. to wrap my arms? And right, so right, right. I personally have a problem with this idea that I'm supposed to have a level of sympathy for people that I honestly <laughs> think just don't deserve it. They yeah, want yeah. you to love LeBron. But here here it is, and I think the internet would definitely want to know, Bomani Jones, top three NBA players playing the game right now. Why? All right. Top two are easy, right? LeBron's number one. I don't think that has to be explained. Mm-hmm. Kevin Durant's number two, and I don't think that that one really has to be mm-hmm. explained. Number three is tricky because Anthony Davis is getting really good. Um, and I don't think it'll be long before he is number three. But what if I said Russell Westbrook? Mm-hmm. Like a healthy Russell Westbrook. I love Russell Westbrook. Mm-hmm. Like I have come to this point where at first I was like, I don't know what that guy's doing. Then I came to watch him and I'm like, I've never seen any I've never seen anybody play that hard before in my life. Like Last minute, there was a game against the Lakers last year where Russell Westbrook took the ball, dunked from like one step inside the free throw line on people, came down the next time down the floor. It's the last two minutes of the game. He took off from the free throw line and tried a finger roll, a finger roll. Like it's crazy. It's whirling dervish. But that team, they can't go far without Russell Westbrook. Like, you know, it's like, is he a real point guard or not? He's Russell Westbrook. Like all that stuff doesn't matter. matter. So you're going to get bad shots. You're going to get things that drive you crazy. And then you're going to get the incredible. You're going to get amazing. Yeah. Like, I'm not sure if he's the number three player in the league, but I'd like him to be the number three player in the league. I I, I wish he was the third best player in the league. What do you think about that think piece that came out recently about Kobe destroying the franchise and being that selfish type of, it's a dilemma, man, because I think a lot of it was true. And I know Henry. Henry Abbott wrote it. I know Henry, and I think a lot of people disbelieve that Henry had this vendetta against Kobe. And what, I don't. Do you think it was a vendetta? I don't think that's. I, I don't think that's the way to put it. I right. I do think that Henry has been critical of Kobe over the years, but I don't think that Henry just woke up and decided I'm going to come slam Kobe Bryant today. That wasn't it. I thought a lot of it made sense. Like the idea, if you were a big time player, would you want to go play with Kobe right now? Because Kobe doesn't know how to Kobe doesn't know how to make way. He doesn't know how to give room to people. And he doesn't think he should have to give room to people. And nobody wants to sign up for that. So Carmelo can say, no, that's not the reason why 
I didn't go to L.A. But if that was the reason why he didn't go to L.A., that wouldn't be a bad reason. Mm -hmm. You know, so I do think that people had questions about the sourcing on. 